so on. Hi, and welcome to Codex. Uh, today, our speaker is Gary Greaves. Gary Greaves is a senior lecturer at the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Dr. Greaves received his Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Cardiff University in 2008 and a PhD in Mathematics from Royal Holloway University of London in 2012 under the direction of James Fraser McKee. <clears throat> from 2012 to 2016, he was a postdoctoral fellow, then assistant professor at the Research Center for Pure and Applied Mathematics at Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan. In 2016, he moved to Nanyang Technological University where he is currently. Dr. Gree's main research interests are in algebraic combinatorics and number theory. And of particular interest to the codex community is his work on equangular lines in both real Euclidean space and over finite fields. Today, he'll be speaking on real equangular line systems in low dimensions. Take it away, Gary. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And I just want to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. It's my pleasure to talk about my work here. So I want to talk today about the real equangular line systems in low dimensional Euclidean spaces. So uh, this is a bit of a maybe sideshow um, compared to the mainstream uh, complex equangular lines. But as you'll see, as I mentioned, there's plenty of work going on uh, in the real space. So uh, I'll start by just defining equangular line system. It's a very simple definition. Uh, it's just a set of lines with the origin of R to the D is called equiangular if the angle between any pair of lines is constant. So this simple definition can come with some simple supporting examples, which I'll just briefly go through. Uh, so in two dimensions, uh, how can you construct an equine line system? Well, you can take a regular hexagon around its origin and join each vertex to its antipode. So that gives you three lines. And then you can go ahead and check uh, what is the angle between any pair of lines, like check the angle here, uh, check the angle here between these two, and then check this angle. I see they're all the same. And so this is an equiangular line system. And after you see this construction in two dimensions, you might try to push it a bit further by looking at um, more polygons and see what you can get. So if you do that, you'll end up with a non-example. Uh, so here I take a regular octagon and I draw, join each vertex again to its antipode. This time I get four lines and then I check the angles. So I check the angle between these two lines. I see, I see I get 45 degrees. I look here, again, I get 45 degrees. Seems okay so far, but then I check this angle and I don't get 45 degrees. And then I see I have at least two angles and so therefore this is not an equiangular line system. Okay, and then if we go to three dimensions, we have similar constructions where we can take a regular icosahedron, join each vertex to its antipode. This gives us six equiangular lines in three dimensions. Okay, so that was the definition and a few supporting examples. Now, what is the main problem we're interested in? So the problem is here, we want to find the largest possible size of an equiangular line system in R to the D. And the setup is you give me some dimension D and I want to know what is this N of D? What is this largest possible size of an equiangular line system living in D dimensions? And this problem dates all the way back to the 1940s, where two dimensions, three dimensions, and four dimensions were known. So we know the answer all the way up to four dimensions back in the 1940s. And there was some progress in the 1960s where we, we worked out uh, five dimensions, six dimensions, and we got a pretty decent lower band on seven dimensions. And then the real breakthrough started to happen in the 70s where the linear algebraic method really took off. And then we knew the answer all the way up to dimension 13. Uh, we skipped 14, 14 is not, uh, not figured out at this point. Uh, 15, we know, 
and then there's a bit of a gap so 16 up to 20 are not yet figured out but dimensions 21 22 and 23 are all decided so this is back in the 70s but now even more recently so just going back five years there's been a whole bunch of uh, work on this problem and its variation uh, so I've tried to group together um, different general approaches to this problem. So at the top, again, this is in the last five years, we have improvements to upper bands using uh, semi-definite program techniques. Uh, then this second batch, we have the celebrated work of working out the asymptotics for a variation where we fix the angle. Then I mentioned these two, which since it involves stuff I'm going to talk about in this form. So here we see some improvements for lower bands in 18 dimensions. And then in this block, we have improvements to upper bands in lower dimensions. So here I'm focusing on 18 because I'll mention it in the talk. And the upper bands are actually for all of the unknown dimensions between 14 and 20. And then, uh, because there's so much recent work, I couldn't continue to group it together in a nice way. And so I just put um, these contributions down as miscellaneous, where we have uh, work on enumerating cytomatrices, matrices, work on the lemon cytal conjecture, and work on equality in the absolute band. Okay, so there's lots of recent work. And here I'm mentioning the state of the art. And so this is a bit of a summary of some of the contributions we've seen. And this is a table where we list N of D for dimension D going from two all the way up to 41. And so you see that these black numbers are where we know what N of D should be. So we know it for dimension two all the way up to 17 now. And then there's these conspicuous three values of D where the upper bands and lower bands are still not equal. And then from 21 up to 41, we again know this value of N of D. And so this is the slide. If you're going to remember one slide from this talk, this is probably the slide for you to, to remember. All right. So now I can talk about the plan of my talk. And this is the first, well, there's two parts. And the part one is going to be talking about constructions of equilateral lines, and in particular, our new improvement to lower bands in 18 dimensions. And the second part, I want to tell you about um, how we uh, figured out the answer for 14, 16, and 17 dimensions. Okay, so part one, we are looking at constructions of equilateral lines, and this is joint work with Jevon Siakuyadi and Pablo Yatsina. So in this part, we're gonna look at some constructions and a highlight will be this new lower band to 18 dimension. Okay, so before we get onto that, I just need to do a bit of groundwork and introduce the Zydel matrix. And so this is the main tool that we uh -huh. use to study a ground line system. And so we start off with some equiangular lines, L1 up to Ln. These are equiangular lines. And we, we assume the angle alpha is positive. And so this angle, okay, really the angle is R cosine of alpha. But you know, if you change units, uh, you can just turn it into some positive alpha is that angle. And this is convenient because uh, if we take unit spanning vectors of our lines, so we'll take our vi to span the line li, then the inner product between any pair pink spanning vectors would be plus or minus this alpha. Then we can work out the gram matrix, the matrix of inner products, and it will look a bit like this. One's in the diagonal, have unit vectors, plus or minus half in the off diagonal, which is definition of x main line system. And the gram matrix looks quite nice, but we can make it look a bit nicer by just minusing off the diagonal ones, minus identity, and then we hide away this alpha, we divide by alpha, and all the off diagonals are now plus or minus one. 
and we can reverse this process. So if you, if you have a grand line system, you can get a Zidal matrix, which is zero plus or minus one symmetric matrix. And in the other direction, if you have a Zidal matrix, you can obtain x random line system. And the information about the x random line system in a Zidal matrix is stored inside the smallest eigenvalue. This is where the details are hidden. And so to see that, if we start off with our unit spanning vectors, and we assume that they you know, together span the whole of R from B, we can construct this matrix B by putting our unit spanning vectors column vectors. This matrix B will have rank D. And then the gram matrix is just B transpose of B. And since the rank of this is B, the smallest eigenvalue will, have, will be equal to zero and have multiplicity N minus B. Uh, that's just because this is a positive semi decimal. And then when you go to the Zidal matrix, this zero eigenvalue gets mapped over to one minus one over alpha. So the moral of the story is you have a Zidal matrix, you want to know how many lines you have, what's the dimension, and what's the angle, you just look at the smallest eigenvalue. So the smallest eigenvalue itself gives you alpha, the angle, and then the multiplicity gives you n and b. Okay, so that's just to introduce the Zidal matrix, which we're going to repeatedly refer to throughout this course. So now on to constructions. I want to start off with the absolute bound. And so the absolute bound is an upper bound on N of D, also known as the Gerson bound. And this says that in D dimensions, the best you can possibly do is D times D plus one over two X random lines in that dimension. And here you can achieve equality when D is two, three, seven, and 23. But this is widely believed to be a complete list. And there's been some recent work on uh, partial classifications. Uh, so now what's happening with these four dimensions? Well, we've already seen two instances where the absolute bound can be achieved. We have equality in the absolute bound, and that's for two dimensions and three dimensions. So the two constructions I started with, uh, the first one gives you three lines in dimension two, the second gives you six lines in dimension three, and this is precisely equality in the absolute bound. Now we move on to seven. So in dimension seven, we can get 28 exponential lines, and the construction is very simple. You can just take this vector with six ones and two minus three, consider all the permutations, and they will span 28 equine angle lines. And so that again gives you equality in the absolute band. And then the, the main one I want to focus on is this configuration of 276 equine angle lines in 23 dimensions. And this can be constructed in a few different ways, but they largely boil down to the existence of the bit design. And so you can obtain this by taking the 253 blocks of this bit design together with 23 points that the block design, that the block design um, contains. And the construction is, is, I can't sum it up in one sentence, but it's relatively straightforward construction. So this 27, this 276 equine lines is really, really, um, really interesting construction. And because of its existence, it leads to the existence of other large constructions in smaller dimensions. So we can look inside the bit design and find many wonderful things. Uh, so we can start off with 276 X random lines in 23 dimensions, directly from the, the bit design. Then we can take the Zidal matrix of that equine line system, then find a principal submatrix of size 176, and that would correspond to um, 176 equiangular lines in 22 dimensions. And then we can repeat this. So we can start off with the 176 by 176 Zidal matrix, look for a principal submatrix of size 126, and if we choose the right one, we'll get 126 equiangular lines in 2021. And you can keep doing this. This is like a cascade 
this cascade all the way down, start off with 276. You can get this construction in dimension 22, this construction in dimension 21, and all the way down to uh, dimension 17. And you can see that these constructions that we have, all coming from the bit design, you can see them in, in this table. So I have 276 here. In fact, it's the best you could do all the way up to 1941. Then 22, we have 176. 21, 126. And then for 20, we have the lower band of 90, which you see here. 19, we have the lower band 72, which you see here. But the interesting point so far is that in dimension 18, this 56 is not here. So actually, we can do better than this 56. And so that gives us some potential interest in this construction of 57. So although we don't know for certain yet that this 57 recital matrix corresponding to the 57 construction comes from a uh, principal submatrix of the recital matrix of the 276 equiangular line in dimension 23, um, so far we don't know, we can't answer whether or not, but we can answer something. We do have some kind of partial information. And so that's relating to this construction of 72 lines in dimension 19. Uh, so first of all, I want to tell you about uh, our new construction. So here's our new construction. How do we, how do we find these 57? So what we do is we look for integer vectors that have squared length 10. Then we want to form a subset of all these integer vectors such that every pair of vectors has inner product plus or minus two. That's, that's the idea. Uh, so how can you do this? Well, you can construct all of these vectors and then you can form a graph. You can have your vectors as vertices and you join the vertices together if the inner product of these vectors is plus or minus two. Then to find a configuration of 57 equiangular lines in dimension 18, you just want to find a clique of size 57 in this graph. And so it turns out that you can find such cliques. And here's an example of one. So I have a matrix here, which we'll call B. And the vectors, oh, sorry, the, the columns of this matrix are these integer vectors with squared length 10. And if you take any pair of these 57 vectors, you'll find that the inner product between any pair is plus or minus two. Um, now we can find, but well, we can form the Zydo matrix of this construction. So this will give us the Zydo matrix. We just take the ground matrix minus the diagonal, divide by the plus or minus two off diagonal. Now we have a Zydo matrix for this configuration. And the nice thing about this construction is the Zydo matrix has only integer eigenvalues. So this is the, the characteristic polynomial of this Zydo matrix. And you'll see that it has, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven distinct uh, integer eigenvalues. And there's something nice about finding a large configuration of lines where the Zydo matrix has only integer eigenvalues. It gives you some feeling of, of uh, maximality. Uh, so that's one construction. Now we want to think, can this construction come as a subset of the bit design in some sense? Or can you find this Zydo matrix F as a principal submatrix of the Zydo matrix coming from the 276 line in the mention 23? So this is the next thing we think about. So as a partial uh, solution, we can instead ask the question, is it a sub-configuration of Asher's lines, the configuration of 72 equine lines in 19 dimensions. And so uh, that's what we're investigating here. So I want to compare this to the two recent constructions by Sulershi and Lin and Yu. Uh, Sulershi got 54 equine lines in dimension 18 by looking inside Asher's lines. And the same method was used by Lin and Yu to get 56 equiangular lines. And so we want to show that we can get configurations of 57 equiangular lines in dimension 18 that definitely don't come from Asher's lines. So the way we'll do that is using an interlacing argument. So 
So we take the Zeidel matrix of Asher's construction and we look at the characteristic polynomial and we see that we get this characteristic polynomial, which this has three eigenvalues. Now, uh, we observe that it has eigenvalue 13 with multiplicity 16. Now, suppose that we have our 57 by 57 Zeidel matrix as a principal submatrix of this Zeidel matrix A. So to get that, since it's order 57, we'll have to delete 15 rows and columns from this Zeidel matrix A. And if we do that, by interlacing, the multiplicity of 13 will go down by at most 15. And so therefore, such a principal submatrix um, of A of order 57 must have 13 as an eigenvalue. And so this is a, if we can find some construction of 57 equilateral lines in dimension 18 whose cytomatrix matrix doesn't have 13 as an eigenvalue, then we know it's definitely not inside Ash's lines. So now we go back and have a look at our characteristic polynomial and we scan through and we, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. So we look at our characteristic polynomial and we see, oh, it does have a 13. Uh, so we have 13 with multiplicity four. However, as I mentioned, this is not the only uh, 57 cleat we can find in our, in our graph. Uh, we can actually find many others. So by doing so, we can find another uh, set of 57 integer vectors of squared length 10 having pairwise in the product plus minus two. And this time, if we form the Zeidel matrix, we get this characteristic polynomial. And notice here, there's no 13. And so therefore, this construction is definitely not inside Ash's, Ash's lines. Okay, and another thing to note is that the number of distinct eigenvalues here is seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And our other construction also has seven distinct eigenvalues. So we found quite a few different constructions and they all have at least seven distinct eigenvalues. So we don't know whether you can do better than uh, if you can find one with fewer than seven or what the significance is of that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about part one about the constructions. So now I'm gonna move on to part two where I want to tell you about our recent improvements to the upper bands in dimension 14, 16 and 17. And this is again joint work with the same Jevon Tiatriadi and Pablo Yatsina. Okay, so now we want to find upper bounds. We've already seen some lower bounds. In the table, um, we saw that, well, we saw that you can get 28 lines using that vector with ones and minus threes. Um, you can get 48 lines inside the bit design. And okay, this 40 comes from some strongly regular graph. So since we have the lower bounds, all we need to do is show that you can't do better than these. So I just need to show you can't get 29 lines in dimension 14, you can't get uh, 41 lines in dimension 16 and 49 in dimension 17. So this is our starting point. So I want to tell you about how we start off this, this, um, this upper bound finding part. Okay, so we start off by assuming that does exist a Zeidel matrix S that corresponds to 29 lines in dimension 14, or there does exist a Zeidel matrix corresponding to 41 lines in dimension 16, and so on. So we're actually imagining there exist these three Zeidel matrices corresponding to 29, 41, 49 equiangular lines in dimension 14, 16, and 17, reflectively. So our starting point is to um, as, well, we're starting by deducing some partial structure of the characteristic polynomials. So I'm not going to go into detail about this. I'm just going to say using uh, some classification from Lemons and Seidel, uh, some integrality result of Neumann, and using the Welch bound, we know that the smallest eigenvalue of each characteristic polynomial must be minus five, and we know the multiplicity. And we can do a bit better by figuring out that there's some other integer eigenvalue with some relatively large multiplicity. 
And so to do this, we're using this intuitive idea that the closer you are to the wealth band, the more geometric forces the eigenvalues are uh, feeling. So that's a kind of intuitive explanation. But to give you an extreme example, if you have equality in the wealth band, then you know what the eigenvalues are. It's going to have two distinct eigenvalues. You know what they are in terms of uh, the parameters. And you, you can kind of generalize that a bit. So if you go a bit further out, but you're relatively close to the wealth band, you might not be able to write down the whole spectrum, but you can write down partial information. And so this is the general idea that we're using to, to deduce that we have these extra um, eigenvalues here. Gary, do we know that these are the extreme eigenvalues? Uh, in what sense are you saying extreme? <clears throat> do all other eigenvalues for the first guy reside between minus five and five? Oh, uh, no, that's, that's not, not the case. So, but in, there is something interesting you can say. There's some kind of radius around the eigenvalue five where all of these, the roots of this polynomial will lie. And again, it's related to the distance, the proximity to the wealth band. Awesome, thank you. So, um, so this is my starting point. So I don't want to go into the precise details. And I'm just going to write this extra factor of unknown eigenvalues. So this is a polynomial whose roots are the unknown eigenvalues that we, we can't quite deduce at this point. Uh, so step one is to figure out all the possibilities for these characteristic polynomials. So I want to figure out if there is a Poseidon matrix uh, with 29 lines in dimension 14, what are the options for my characteristic polynomial? Uh, so the first thing to observe is that since S is a real symmetric matrix, all of the roots of this polynomial are going to be real. So this is a totally real polynomial. So we want to find all possible totally real polynomials to satisfy certain conditions. Okay, so this brings us on to uh, this slide here, where we talk about modular restrictions on the coefficients of characteristic polynomials of Zydo matrices. Um, so here the setup is the S is a Zydo matrix of order N. And we have some polynomial looking like this, integer polynomial. We say that it's type two if two to the i divides the i coefficient. Okay, so this is a this is definition for polynomial. And we have a slightly weaker definition, aptly named weakly type two. So we say it's weakly type two if two to the i minus one divides the i coefficient. And the really nice thing, the kind of strong restriction we found is that if I take a characteristic polynomial of the Zydo matrix and I substitute for x, x minus one, then the resulting polynomial is weakly type two and type two if n is even, so even stronger. So that's um, a condition we have on coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. The next thing we know is the top coefficients. So we kind of get the top coefficients for free when we're dealing with Zydo matrices. So I take the characteristic polynomial of the Zydo matrix. Obviously, the top coefficient is one, the monic polynomial. Now, the first coefficient should be zero because all of the diagonal entries of the Zydo matrix are equal to zero. So therefore, the trace is zero. And therefore, the first coefficient should be zero. And we can do one better by looking at S squared. So if I take S squared, all of the diagonal entries are going to be n minus one. So the trace of s squared will be n times n minus one. And then using Newton's identities, we can get the second coefficient should be minus n choose two. So we know we always get the top coefficients for free. And now we can start thinking about an algorithm to generate all of these possible, um, all these possible options for phi that we have here, here, and here. And so we're going to use the McKee Smith Robinson algorithm. This is an algorithm that was initially due to Robinson, I think in the 1940s, and then has been developed by McKee and Smith with some kind of speed boosts and refinements. And this algorithm can generate all totally real poly integer polynomials whose top coefficients are fixed. 
So the headline is we can generate all of the candidate characters polynomials by applying the McKee Smith Robinson algorithm with some kind of weakly type two filter on the coefficients. Uh, there's a small complication that I'm hiding away. So this is actually a subset rather than exactly what we get, but it's a slight complication that we don't fully understand yet, but uh, I just want to kind of hide those details of the rug. So to generate all the candidate characters polynomials, we run this algorithm, and I want to give you an example of how, how it works. So suppose we want to find all totally real type two polynomials of this form, where the top three coefficients are fixed. We have top coefficients one, minus 18, and 112. And then we don't know A3 and A4. But we want this to be totally real and type two. And so I want to give you an illustration of how this algorithm is going to work. So we take our starting polynomial, then we repeatedly differentiate it until we just have one unknown coefficient. So if we do that in this case, we just differentiate one uh, once differentiate once and we get this polynomial. Now, since the, the roots of the derivative interlace with the roots of the original polynomial, we know that this polynomial must also be totally real. And so now we can, we can figure out range of values for A3 by, well, we can either look at this graph or work out the local maxima and minima. So I've drawn a picture here of this cubic. So it's this 4x cubed minus 54x squared plus 224x. It looks like this. But you, you see that this is definitely not totally real. To make it totally real, we need to shift it down so that the x axis is going through this point here. It's going between these two uh, local extrema. And so working these out gives us the bound. So I see this is going to be 264. This one is going to be 294. And so I see that I need to shift it down by amounts related to those numbers. So in other words, A3 must be in this range from minus 294 up to minus 264. So that gives us a range of values that guarantees this derivative is totally real. Now we can combine that with the type two property. So type two says that two to the three should divide A3. So in other words, A divides A3. And so now we can reduce this range by just checking which elements are divisible by eight. So the original range is 31 values. And we reduce that using type two condition down to just four values. Okay, and then we can consider all of these values for A3 and then rerun this idea. So this algorithm is a recursive idea, uh, algorithm. So then we just say, okay, set a3 equal to minus 288, then work out the value for A4, the range of values for A4, check which values in this range are divisible by 16, because it's A4, so it should be divisible by two to the four. And that just gives you 256. Then you do the same thing for the next value for A3, and minus 280, you find the range for A4, then just pick out the ones divisible by 16, and then you, you keep going. Uh, so when you run this algorithm, what you're doing is you're building a tree. You start off with your one polynomial, you work out all the, the four possibilities for A3, and then you keep going down making more and more children. So an important thing to note here is that the degree of this polynomial is really going to strongly influence the running time, because it was going to, it's going to grow exponentially. So that's something we'll come back to later on. Okay, so now we have this algorithm, and I gave you a small example to give you some idea how it works. We can generate all of the candidate characteristic polynomials. So the result of this is for 29 lines of dimension 14, we find that there's just 31 candidate characteristic polynomials. Um, for 41 lines in dimension 16, we get 22 characteristic, uh, candidate characteristic polynomials. And for 49 in dimension 17, we get 194. So I just want to comment about the discrepancies between the results here. So I put the computation time on the right. And you see it just takes a matter of minutes for dimension 14, dimension 16. For dimension 17, it takes two and a half hours. 
Uh, so why is that? What's going on? And again, it comes down to the proximity to the Welch band. So for dimension 14 and dimension 60, with angle uh, 1 over 5, the Welch band gives you uh, 30 for dimension 14 and uh, 42 for dimension 60. So you see these numbers are just one away from the Welch band. So they're kind of closer, and so they feel a bit more geometric force. And this comes out in the algorithm. But for dimension 17, 49 is two away from the Welch band. So there's less kind of geometric force being applied here. And so as a result, the ranges for your coefficient are going to be larger when you run the McGee-Smith-Robinson algorithm. And as a result, you get more candidate categories of polynomials and the computation time takes much longer. OK, so now we have candidate categories of polynomials. Now we want to try and show that there doesn't exist any Zeidel matrix having those candidate categories of polynomials as characteristic polynomials. So this is what we're going to do next. And the main idea is to use this identity. We have this really nice looking identity that says, if I sum up all of the characteristic polynomials of principal submatrices, uh, where I delete the i thrown column, that will give me the derivative of the characteristic polynomial of the original matrix. So this is, this is the main tool that we're going to use. And here, the setup is that S is a Zeidel matrix of order n odd, and S brackets i is the principal submatrix obtained by deleting i through n column. And so our strategy is to work out all the possible solutions to this key identity for each of the candidate characteristic polynomials. So the idea here is we assume that the characteristic polynomial of S is equal to P of X, one of our candidate characteristic polynomials, then we want to figure out all the possible solutions of this. So we want to figure out possible polynomials for uh, characteristic polynomials of these principal submatrices. And then we want to check which combinations of these can give us equality here. So this is where we introduce the deck. So we, call, we introduce something called deck of P. Gary. And uh, this is just made up of all the polynomials that satisfy, they look, well, they satisfy the necessary condition of being characteristic polynomial of one of these principal submatrices. Hey, Gary. Ah, uh, yes. Your key identity. Yeah. Does that, does that assume just symmetric? How general is that? Uh, yeah, how general does this go? I've seen it for Hermitian. So I think Hermitian, it works. I don't know how much more general you can go. Where did you pluck that out of? Sorry? Where did you get it from? Oh, I first saw this in Godzilla Royal's How to Break Graph Theory book. I see. Thank you. OK, so I'm talking about the deck. And the deck consists of all of these, uh, all polynomials that look at, that they satisfy necessary conditions for these uh, can characteristic polynomials of principal submatrices. So what does that look like? Well, they're going to be integer polynomials. They are characteristic polynomials of Zeidel matrices. So we get the first three coefficients. So monic, zero trace, and then this n minus one, choose two coefficient. We also have interlacing. So these polynomials should interlace P, which is acting like this um, characteristic polynomial of S. And we also get that if we plug in x minus 1 for x, the resulting polynomial of type 2. And this is because we assume n is odd here. So n is odd, so n minus 1 is even. And so we don't just get weakly type 2, we get type 2. And so now, once we form the deck, we want to look for all the solutions to this key identity, which I just rewrite in this form here. So I just kind of translate the key identity in deck form. So I want to find coefficients n sub f for each polynomial in my deck, Oops, sorry. such that this sum gives me the derivative of my candidate characteristic polynomial p of x. And I call such solutions interlacing configurations. OK, so to get a bit more understanding of this, we can look at an example. 
So here I start off with my candidate characteristic polynomial P of X, which is the degree seven thing. So this is my candidate characteristic polynomial, and I want to find all interlacing configurations for this candidate characteristic polynomial. And so I first form the deck. So this is the deck of P, consists of these four polynomials. And we can construct the deck a bit like we were constructing our candidate characters of polynomials. We can run the McKee-Smith-Robinson algorithm with a type two filter on the coefficients. And if we do that, we'll get these four polynomials. Uh, okay, we also need to check they interlace with, uh, with our candidate characters of polynomial. So we get these four polynomials. And now we want to look for solutions to this identity two. And so we can enumerate all the solutions. We just solve some linear system with constraints. And we find that this is the only interlacing configuration. So we have three times F1 plus two times F2 plus two times F4 gives you the derivative. Now, in general, there may be no solution. There may be no interlacing configurations, or there might be many interlacing configurations. However, if there's no interlacing configurations, then there's no way this can correspond to an actual Zeidel matrix. So in this case, this polynomial P of X does correspond to a Zeidel matrix. So here's the Zeidel matrix, the seven by seven Zeidel matrix and the characteristic polynomials equal to P of X. And we can write down all of these um, characteristic polynomials of these principal minors where it deletes the i row and column and we see this distribution here. And now we can make a connection between these coefficients. So I have three times F1 in my interlacing configuration. So that means there must be three indices such that if I delete the, the corresponding rows and columns, I'll get F1 as my characteristic polynomial. So I can see that if I delete the third row and column, I get F1, the fifth, fifth row and column, I get F1 and also six. So these three, uh, principal submatrices give me F1. So that's what this coefficient is corresponding to. And I see a two here for F2, so I should get two indices that give me F2. And I also see a two for F4. So I can get them from these two principal submatrices. And notice here that F3 is not used at all, right? F3 doesn't show up in, in the interlacing configuration. And so it's kind of like a junk polynomial in the deck. It doesn't really, it's like a, it satisfies necessary conditions, but it doesn't actually contribute to the interlacing configuration. Okay, so now um, after seeing this example, we can apply this idea and we look at all of our candidate characteristic polynomials and we, we throw away the, those that don't have any interlacing configurations. And this really, uh, cuts down the number of categories of polynomials we need to consider. So for, for dimension 14, only six of them have interlacing configurations. For dimension 16, only two of them have interlacing configurations. And dimension 17, only 28 out of the 194 have interlacing configurations. And so I, again, just put the computation time here, just to indicate the, again, the discrepancy and you can see that the first two just take again a matter of minutes but this time the computational time for dimension 17 took 6.5 hours and i want to comment a bit more about the distribution of that computation time so i made a bar chart here where you can see that so along the bottom we have all of the candidate characters of polynomials in dimension 17 and here we have the time taken to compute the deck. And you can see here that there's, there's six outliers that took the majority of the computation time. Uh, so the, com the computation time wildly fluctuates and it's really sensitive to the number of distinct, um, number of distinct roots that the polynomials have. And so a comment here is it would be nice to have some maybe some more efficient alternative method to deal with these outliers. So you can kind of flatten the overall distribution of the computation time. Just okay. a quick question. Are these 
expenses one, the ones that give solutions or not, or is it unrelated? Oh, all of these don't have interlacing configurations. So this is looking at, I'm saying that 28 out of the 194 don't have interlacing configurations. And we can check that by, well, actually we solve the dual linear system. So we use Farkas lemma to show that if you have a solution- Here, This 166 are the non-solution, okay? The those that are killed. Yeah, so the we only focus on the ones we're ones. Sorry? For the positive cases, what's the timing there? Um, I haven't got a, an overview for that. I kind of treat them uh, case by case. Okay. But I, I can tell you that none of them take, there's nothing like this outline. So the ones, the ones that um, are left over is relatively, relatively fast. I can't tell you exactly, but it's going to be somewhere around maybe five minute mark. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now we want to deal with the, the candidate calculus polynomials that do have interlacing configurations. So we've got rid of all the ones that don't have interlacing configurations. And this is where we introduce warranted polynomials. Uh, so what is a warranted polynomial? So this is a polynomial inside our deck. So I've just reminded you here, what is the deck? And a warranted polynomial is a polynomial in the deck whose coefficient is always positive for any interlacing configuration. So it's like a guaranteed uh, principal, a characteristic of polynomial of a principal submatrix. So no matter what your interlacing configuration is, if you have a warranted polynomial, it's guaranteed that the warranted polynomial is uh, contributing. And so warranted polynomials are really, really useful because uh, if you have a warranted polynomial, what you can do is reduce the deck just to those polynomials that are compatible with warranted polynomials. So it's, this is a notion of compatibility that I plan to tell you about in a couple of slides. But first I want to show you the application of warranted polynomials together with compatibility. And so to show that a, a polynomial in the deck is warranted, what you can do is take that polynomial outside of the deck and then try to find an interlacing configuration. If you find there's no interlacing configuration, then you know that that polynomial must be warranted. So there's no solution without a warranted polynomial. Okay, so this is just to motivate this, ex this next notion of compatibility, which I haven't told you about yet, but you should have some intuitive idea that once we find a warranted polynomial, we can, just, we can reduce to only those in the deck that are compatible with the warranted polynomial. And so the, the result of doing this is the following. So we can further reduce the candidate characters of polynomials in the following way. So the first way we do it is we find there are two warranted polynomials, but they're not compatible with each other. So if they're not compatible with each other, then there's no way there could be a Zyder matrix corresponding to uh, that candidate characters of polynomial. So this happens for three out of the six remaining polynomials for dimension 14. It actually eliminates all of the remaining uh, candidate characters of polynomials for dimension 16, and uh, it eliminates 11 out of the 28 for dimension 17. And we can apply it in a slightly more general way. So again, this is applying warranty and compatibility so what we do here is we find a warranted polynomial, then we restrict to the subset of the deck that's compatible with that warranted polynomial, and we find that there's no interlacing configuration on that subset. So this method eliminates one of the remaining three candidate characters polynomials for dimension 14, and eight out of the 17 remaining candidate characters polynomials for dimension 17. So I told you about how warranty and compatibility can be used together to, to eliminate some more candidate characters polynomials. And so now I want to tell you what exactly is this compatibility relation. And at this point, I just want to ask the organizers, uh, how much time uh, am I allowed to continue speaking? I'd say another five minutes since we started a few minutes late. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll go uh, a bit fast through the compatibility. So the setup for compatibility is we take M to be an integer symmetric matrix of order N. Uh, sigma M is a set of simple eigenvalues. And then Q of X is the polynomial whose roots are all the non-simple eigenvalues. So this just has roots. Here I'm dividing the minimal polynomial by the polynomial whose roots are simple eigenvalues. And so I get uh, a polynomial whose roots are all non-simple eigenvalues. And I denote U sub lambda to be the, uh, a unit lambda eigenvalue. Then the spectral decomposition theorem tells us that if I, if I um, plug M into Q, I can write it as the sum over the simple eigenvalues, Q of the simple eigenvalue lambda multiplied by the outer product of unit lambda eigenvector with itself. Now we make a couple of observations about this. So firstly, M is an integer matrix, Q is an integer polynomial, and so therefore this is an integer matrix on the left-hand side. And the next, uh, the next tool we use is that the i entry of U sub lambda is determined by this polynomial. So the characteristic polynomial of the principal submatrix obtained by deleting the i thrown column. So this is special for simple eigenvalues. So since lambda is simple, I can determine the i entry by this polynomial. And so this is going to give us our compatibility condition for the deck. And so it really depends on how exactly we represent the i entry of this vector u. Uh, so we do that by um, defining this angle for polynomial. So we take a polynomial inside the deck, and since it interlaces this polynomial, uh, we can factorize it in this way here. So I can factorize it as the characteristic polynomial of m divided by minimal polynomial of m multiplied by some polynomial f, plain f. So I can use this plain f to define the angle of the, the math frac f with respect to lambda as the square root of f of lambda divided by derivative of the minimal polynomial evaluated at lambda. Okay, so this is just a, a standard definition and it just so happens to be your angle that has nothing to do with the angle of the Eckerine line system. And so the really nice thing is that for simple eigenvalues, we can write the i entry of um, a unit eigenvector for, for lambda in terms of this angle, uh, uh, plus or minus this, this angle. And this is really, really useful because I can write this in terms of this polynomial. And so the condition we saw on this previous slide is that the ij entry of this integer matrix is given by this expression here. So this is an expression for characteristic polynomials of principal submatrices. And so I can, I can turn that into a condition for polynomials in the deck. So these polynomials in my deck, they should act like these polynomials. And so I just impose this condition. So this, there should be some plus or minus one vector where this sum is an integer. So this is our notion of compatibility. I'm gonna skip the next slide which is about uh, some really cool computational speed up. And I'll jump to the remaining candidate characters of polynomials. So after we did all of that elimination of candidate characters of polynomials, we ended up with just two left for dimension 14 and um, nine left for dimension 17. And these are a bit tricky to eliminate. So there's not really a general method I can tell you um, there are some general techniques where we use eigenspace orthogonality. Uh, we use the existence of some Euler graph in the switching class. And there's also a nice, a nice result um, by Willem Harmers and his co-authors that shows the non-existence of some strongly regular graph. And this top surviving candidate characters of polynomial, if this exists, 
that implies the existence of some strongly regular graph whose spin zone cannot exist. Uh, and so that's the general overview. Of, so, I, so I can't go into the details and I'm also out of time. So I'll, I'll end with my summary slide, which is again showing you uh, this table and the things that we went over with dimension 14, 16, 17, and the first part we saw this new lower bound for dimension 18. So I'll stop there. Thank you a lot for your attention. And now I'll take questions. Thank you very much.